Hello everyone, my name is Nicola Van der Put, and today in this keynote that's going to last for I think, half an hour, we're going to discuss, I'm going to introduce you to what I call demand planning excellence and how to achieve it using my two favorite tools, machine learning and forecast value added. So we're going to discuss them one by one and see how these two tools are really going to be basically the, the, the path for you to demand planning excellence. Um, just as a minute to just introduce myself, if you're not familiar with my work, um, I, I would just like to say that I'm someone who's genuinely passionate about demand forecasting and inventory planning. So if you have any kind of question related to these two topics, well, don't hesitate to send me a message on LinkedIn or an email. So basically, um, I would like to take just a minute to explain my own journey through these two topics. I started by um, working on machine learning for demand forecasting in, I think, 2017. And at the time, it, well, it was 2017, so that was before ChatGPT, you know. And at the time, there were basically no resource available online on how you could use yourself machine learning to make your own uh, forecasting model. That was 2017. Machine learning was not yet a big, a big thing. So it was a bit um, confusing how to do that. So as I started to develop my own model, I was thinking, okay, a lot of people want to do that. And that's why I started to write my first book, Data Science for Supply Chain Forecasting. And my objective there in this book was really basically to explain to anyone reading the book how I was doing things and taking you step by step, step by step from zero to basically hero. So the book starts with you have no, you don't have experience with Python, you don't have experience with machine learning, you, you don't know much or anything about data science, and it's really taking you step by step to make your own model. So when I was done with these machine learning model for demand forecasting, I moved on to inventory optimization, which is the next very important step. And then again, I decided to write a book to really expose to people how you could make your own model using Python and how you could make simulation to confirm these model um, worked. And then finally, my third book, Demand Forecasting Best Practices, this one is from uh, 2023. So this is the most recent book. In this one, I'm really taking a step back sign where for once, this is not going to be about the model, but it's going to be about the process itself. How should you lead your team to achieve excellence for demand planning? Um, what kind of data should you look for? What's the granularity? What's the right horizon? What's the right KPI? What kind of model could you use to power that? And finally, I discuss a lot of forecast value added and the politics of demand planning to help you out to, to navigate that. So that's where I am in my own journey about these two subjects. I hope that maybe in two years, I can show you a fourth book, maybe on the process of uh, inventory planning. We'll see. But so far, this is where I am personally. Um, so as shared today, it's it's going to be a 25 minutes, 30 minutes um, keynote, mostly on how to use machine learning together with forecast value added. But actually, I want to hear about you, about what's basically causing you challenges today or your own point of view towards machine learning and forecast value added. So to do that, I would ask you to join me on using this tool. So you basically just have to scan the digicode there on the left side of the screen, and that's going to allow me to ask you a question. Um, we already have 72 people connected. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Basically, to join, you just have to scan this code with your phone or use this participation link. I'm going to put it on the chat, so it's going to be very easy for everyone uh, to join. Let me do that right now, and I see we have 280 people. This is amazing. So I just shared with you the link again. You can click on this link, and I see it's now 160 people. This is amazing. Thank you so much for attending today and joining me on this. So first question I have for you, um, it's quite a general question, but that's important for me is that allows me to basically know what I should talk in my next webinar, what you are interested with, and what you are struggling with. So I'm just asking you currently, if you're working together with demand planning, or maybe you have colleagues in demand planning, just let me know what's basically causing you uh, trouble and what's for you basically just fine. And I'm really curious to see the answer of nearly 200 professionals saying well, what's causing um, issues right now. Now, that's also interesting because I'm thinking for every single of these elements, did I already do an article or webinar? And for most of them, yes, but not all of them. 
So let's see what's the most important for you. Okay, so we just got the first answers in. That's interesting. So generating a good steady scale baseline forecast seems to be an issue. We have data cleaning and outliers. That was the subject. I think we, we did a webinar on that two months, three months ago. So if you're if you're dealing with if you have if you're having issue with outliers and data cleaning, you can go on YouTube, type my name and outlier. I'm sure you're gonna find back the webinar I did three months ago. New product introduction. I recently published an article on it on Medium. If you find my blog, this is gonna be something. I know this is very interesting, the generating a good statistical baseline forecast, because that's one of the things we're gonna discuss um, today. So that might be very interesting for you. Okay, thank you so much. This is very interesting for me because this allows me to understand what's um, important for you, uh, and this will help me for future content. So before we really start to, to deep dive into today's subject, I'd like to start with this slide just to say once more that forecast accuracy matters. Um, I know that when I discuss with prospect, with clients, um, an improvement project for demand planning, I often get the question, okay, but what's the return on investment for this project? So basically, where Nikolai, if we can improve forecasting accuracy by 1%, how much money are we going to make out of that? Um, unfortunately, I think it's nearly impossible to answer this question. Uh, we can only get some kind of estimation, some kind of approximation, and I'm afraid that in some cases, to get a good approximation of how much money there is behind 1% forecasting accuracy, it might take you more time to answer this question than just to get this extra 1% accuracy. Um, now, of course, here on this line, I try to give you different point of view. Uh, the, the, the IBF, McKinsey, and myself subchains. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not really sure on how Gartner got to this percentage. I find that if Gartner is right and is correct, and 1% forecasting accuracy result in all these improvements, I would be a billionaire today. I'm not a billionaire, so I think Gartner is way too optimistic, and I would stick to the three others um, approximation. Yet, what's important here is to understand that as soon as we improve forecasting accuracy, you're going to get business benefit that are very tangible and there is a direct correlation between forecasting accuracy and uh, overall business value. So this being said, you, you might be thinking and we might all think, OK, now forecasting accuracy, demand planning, this is very important. So we should be very good at doing this. But again, um, so academics have been studying for, I think now 15 years, 20 years, if people are good or bad at improving forecasts. So basically what they did is they analyzed different supply chain, I think four to eight supply chain. They look at how planners review uh, different products. They look at how planners were basically looking at all time series and were changing forecasts. And these academics, they saw that basically in 50% of the cases, people did not add any kind of value to these forecasts when they were changing them. Which is a nice say, a nice way to say that 50% of the time they were basically destroying value. Which is also a very nice way to say that if they didn't touch the forecast at all, well, the accuracy would be more or less the same. And this is very interesting because it means that we as human, we tend to overdo it. We tend to do too much. And actually, if we were just working less on these forecasts and we were just touching the most important item, it's very likely we would add more value. Um, I think there is hope because there are many best practices to apply to add a lot of value, and we're going to discuss some of them today and maybe maybe some of them later in a future webinar. But one of my key ideas is how can we do better than that? How can we really add value? Now, we need to answer this question to start with something very, very basic and to start with why. OK, but why as supply chain do we forecast demand and the, the basic 101 answer is when we want to predict what's ahead, we want to predict the future so we can make the right decision right now. So as a supply chain, you have a lot of decision to make. You need to decide uh, how much to produce, how much to ship, uh, these kind of things, how, how many people to hire. And to make a good decision, you basically need to have good uh, pieces of 
information, right? It's the same as, well, if you want to buy, I don't know, a new house, a new car, you would want to have a lot of information about this car or this house. Same for your supply chain. So demand forecasting, again, it's just about providing good information to your colleagues, okay? Um, so I like to introduce this with pirates because everyone understands pirates. So you know you have this specific pirate who's just looking at the horizon. And that's the job of this pirate to look at the horizon. And for me, this pirate is the demand planner. So this person is looking at the horizon and is trying to describe what he sees exactly as it is to the colleagues and colleagues on the ship, they're going to make decisions. But we really have to separate these two processes. So one process is just about information. It's just about trying to predict the future, what's ahead. It's unbiased. And then we give this piece of information to other people, to the crew on the ship. And the crew, we hope, is going to make the right decision using these pieces of information. Now, if we want to get really good at demand forecasting, something I call demand planning excellence, there are two things that are, I think, very important. First, efficacy, meaning that we want to have forecasts that really support decision of other people in your supply chain. It, that's very important. And then we don't want to work so much on it. So we want to reduce workload, and at the same time, we really want to add value to provide good information to our colleagues. Now, by the way, on this slide, you don't see forecasting accuracy. I think for me, forecasting accuracy is just a byproduct and something you want to achieve, of course. But the real thing you want to do is to give the right forecast on the right granularity, right horizon to your colleague. Now, to get there, and if you're familiar with my work and with my books, you, you, you will recognize this, of course. I see five different steps. So defining the objective of what you want to achieve, granularity, horizon, and so on finding the right data, especially demand data, choosing the right set of metrics, and finally finding the right model and finding the right process to enrich that. So of course, today I don't have the time to discuss everything in detail. That would basically take me 12 to 14 hours, and that's the, basically the, the, the content of my training course. Today, we're just going to focus on how can we use machine learning to achieve that, and how can we use forecast value added together with it. Um, before we do that, because I know this is quite confusing for a lot of supply chain practitioners and it can, get, it can get quite tense. We need to just discuss for a few minutes the difference between forecasting and planning. So it's very, very important, as I explained to you with these pirates, to really understand that there is a, main, a big difference between trying to assess what's ahead in terms of crime, in terms of expectation, in terms of demand, and planning, which is more about making decisions. So you could say, well, tomorrow, we think our clients want to buy 100 products. OK, great. But we decide to produce 1,000 because of minimum order quantity, because we want to be on the safe side, because we got a discount. That's fine. So we see that there is a difference between making this forecast and the planification. Now, I see also a lot of people who would say, well, if we want to be on the safe side, I would just increase my forecast plus 20%. Or I'm going to increase my forecast. So if I give this to purchasing, I'm sure they're going to buy enough. This is not a good idea. What you need to do is then change inventory policies or change the way you, you, you do supply planning. Now, again, it's very important to understand that demand forecasting is not the same as sales forecasting, which is not the same as supply planning, which is not the same as budget, and so on. All these things are very different, meaning that you're going to get different numbers. Now, one of the root causes for bad forecasting is that people confuse planning with forecasting, and they confuse sales and revenue with unconstrained demand. Again, I'm going to go quickly on this slide. Usually I take a bit more of time, but today it's just um, discussing this slide before jumping into machine learning. I want to really take the time to really define what would be the difference between demand forecasting and, for example, the supply chain. So the supply chain, we just decide how much to produce, how much to store, how much safety stuff we want to have, and so on. Whereas the demand forecast is just asking, okay, asking yourself, how much, how many products do my client want to buy? Now, if you, if you merge this demand forecast with the supply plan, you can get a sales forecast, meaning, OK, I think my clients they want to buy 100 products, and we decided to only produce 50 because we're constrained, because the machine is going to break down, or maybe we have a shortage with the supplier and raw material. For some reason, we only do 50. Now, you know your client, or you think your clients they want to buy 100, but you're only going to produce 50. So your sales forecast is only, only going to be 50 units. But you decided to produce only 50. You could maybe 
find another supply plan and put the priority on this and do 100 units, right? Now here, it's very important to understand the difference between demand forecast on the left side and sales forecast on the right side. And finally, if you get your sales forecast, you can start expressing it in value, in dollar, in euro, whatever, and start having a really revenue forecast. But we understand, and that's very important to, to get that right, that demand forecast, sales forecast, revenue forecast are um, different. Now, back to my um, information game. So I think that if you want to get really good at forecasting, especially as a human and not as a machine, and I hope I'm discussing this with, with human and I'm not talking to machine right now. So forecasting for me, it's an information game. So basically, if you have more info, if you have more insights, it's likely that you can win at this game. The first piece of data that is the most important for you is to ensure that you can properly collect unconstrained demand from your clients. So one of the way, but that's not the only way, one of the way to do that is basically to censor periods with shortages. So if you have access to inventory data and you're doing daily or weekly forecasting, it's kind of easy for you to flag period when you had a shortage and say, well, during this period, it's kind of normal. My sales were close to zero simply because I had a shortage. So I cannot take these specific weeks into account because this data is crap. And yes, I have zero sales, but demand from client must have been much higher. Simply, we couldn't see it because we have no inventory. So the first information you really have to clean and to spend time working on would be this demand collection. Now, once you have this, you can move on to something I call business driver or demand driver, which will be all the things impacting demand. So typically, um, promotion would be number one. Uh, pricing might also be interesting, but less than promotion usually. Um, some companies, you have access to sellouts or maybe you in make to order and you have pre-orders coming from your client. That's also very important to forecast future demand. Maybe the weather can be taken into account and so on. The way I see it is a demand planner shouldn't be someone who's just looking at the graph and thinking, well, the forecast goes like this, and I think it should be more like that, so I'm going to correct it. For me, if you play this kind of game, first it's going to be very manual, and then your chance of winning against the machine are very, very low. So I wouldn't spend time doing that. Instead, I would spend time really thinking as a reporter, really thinking like, hey, What's driving demand? Is it promotion? Is it prices? Is it the weather? Is it, I don't know, holidays? And how can I bring these things into a tool so the tool takes it into account automatically? And for me, the demand planner would be someone who's talking to the client to try to convince them to get sell out, to try to get better information about promotion and so on. More about this uh, later. Now, before I move on, I would like again to ask your opinion about something. Um, for you, based on the supply chain you are currently working with, what are the demand driver or business driver that's currently impacting your business? So I guess for most of you, if you B to C, that's going to be a promotion, but we might see some other thing as well. So please take some time and rank these items from zero to five. Five, you would say, well, this is very, very important for us. And of course, if you click on macroeconomic, I would be very curious uh, for you to tell me in the chat um, what kind of macro macroeconomic is impacting your demand. And I see that already some of you are, are saying macroeconomic. I would love to see in the chat what's, what's behind this. And I see that we have now 300 people joining. This is, this is amazing. Thank you so much. Now, this is an interesting result because I see here that pricing is number one. So pricing is something that I'm using more and more in my project because I'm, I'm lucky enough to get clients who can get me uh, historical prices. And what I see is that actually prices are not so important, which is kind of very um, insightful because this raises a lot of questions. Should we increase prices if we don't see that client really respond to it, especially during inflation? So this is a very interesting one. But definitely based on the forecast engine I am creating personally, for me, promotion would be number one if, if you do promotion and prices would be much, much uh, lower. Something that's dramatically important if you're lucky enough to have this info would be sellout and pre-orders. 
So you can definitely make models that take into account sellouts, the inventory level of your clients, and um, pre-orders. Um, again, if you um, join this meeting quite late, you can go on WooClap. It's for free. You can you don't even have to do an account. You can just click there on the link I just uh, share on the comments, and this will allow you to answer my uh, following question. Thank you so much. So. Again, for me, something that's very, very important is this sentence. Forecasting is an information game. It's about how much information can you find and can you feed into your model? So let's stick for me to the most important one, promotion, shortages, pricing. But of course, feel free to think about adding any other uh, words that is relevant for you there. So what you want to do as a supply chain leader is basically to create kind of a bulletproof automated forecast engine. So you want to have a forecast engine that is so good that if you say, well, promotion are important for my business and weather is important for my business, you want your forecast engine to take that into account automatically for you and doing it the right way. So what you don't want to do is to say something like, well, pricing is important, but we don't know how to automate it. We don't know how to fit it to our uh, software. So basically, we're going to... Um, ask demand planners manually to review the impact of pricing and manually changing forecast. You don't want to do this. You want the software to do it for you. Now, the main issue right now is that statistical models, they will have a very hard time at doing that. I'm not saying that statistical models, there is no way they can do it. There are ways to do it. It's not going to be extremely smart. It's not going to be very advanced and it's going to be very complicated. But there are some ways to take these into account. Well, it's not going to work great. One of the issues, basically, you have two issues. Is first, it's mostly linear, meaning that if you do, I don't know, if you increase the price by 1%, you're going to have an impact on demand of 1%. If you do price plus 2%, the model will think you're going to get plus 2%. Of course, I'm simplifying a bit, but it's very likely you're going to have a linear impact. The other issue you're going to face is that statistical tool look at product one by one in insulation so if you had a product that has been running for two years it's very likely that you only did promotion just once a year so for example you would do i don't know uh, winter sales and it means that well if we look at this product we only had two winter sales in the past so if you want to predict a new one you only have two occurrences in the past so statistical tool we suffer from linearity and it will also suffer from the fact that well you just have a few data points, if not just one or two data points when you're thinking about promotion of price changes. So it's very unlikely that statistical tool will basically understand what's going on, first because they're not smart enough, but also simply because it didn't see so many occurrences. So no chances. On the other side, the other contender, you have machine learning. So machine learning is especially good at dealing with a lot of data, and it's especially good at dealing with a lot of business driver. But on top of that, it's not going to be constrained by this linearity, and it's going to be able to look at the whole data set. So maybe you never did um, uh, buy three, get four promotion on this specific product, but maybe you did that on another 20 type of product. So machine learning will look at, okay, but what happens on similar type of product when you do this kind of promotion, and it's going to learn from that, and apply this relationship to this new product. So you don't need to have been doing this promotion 20 times in the past to be able to predict it in the future on this product. And that's why machine learning is so good. Now, of course, maybe you're thinking, okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, I appreciate your slides, thank you so much, but I don't trust you. Like, this is just you saying that, but maybe it doesn't work. I, I just don't trust you. That's fine. Don't take my word for it. So let me show you a few facts to, to just explain how good machine learning is compared to statistical model. So first, there is something called forecasting competition, which are usually open so anyone can join. Um, in the recent years, we had three competitions since 2018. They were all related, related to retailers, and anyone could join this competition and could basically submit their own forecast using any technique they wanted. Okay, any technique you you basically could do them manually if you wanted to. So we have three competition. Every single competition was won by a machine learning model. But what's worse is that if you look at the top ten or even top twenty contenders, every single one of them was using machine learning. So there is not a single statistical tool that was within the top 20. That's just to tell you how, 
I don't know, outdated a simple statistical engine spar, it means that if you have a competition tomorrow, no one would ever think about using these kind of tools anymore. Everyone would go to machine learning. On my personal project, the one I am leading with my teams together with my client, if I look at the four last big forecasting project we did, every single time we could be benchmarked by 20, 25, 30%. Now, again, for every single of these um, projects, I took the time to write an article to really explain what the data set looks like, how we did that, uh, what's really the improvement step by step we achieved, how fast it's running, and so on. So all the information is there. I'm going to share the slide with you. You can just click on this link, and you're going to get the detailed case studies on how we did that and what were the data set like. I think my conclusion from that is, Machine learning will always be, or nearly always be, statistical uh, model. So it would be very, very exceptional that today in 2024 you would find a use case for supply chain where machine learning cannot beat a statistical um, engine. But there is one condition to that: is you need to know how to use it. And I'm going to come back to this uh, in a minute. Before I do that, just to show you basically how machine learning works. Um, here's just a short summary of a case study I published two years ago. Again, if you want to have all the details, it's on my blog. So for this case, we, we did a forecast engine that was forecasting demand um, one year, one year and a half for a retailer. We used this model to predict demand in 10,000 stores for the next year and a half. Now, it was a data set that was promotion driven. We had access to inventory. We had access to shortages. And what I try to do for this very specific case is to show step by step what's the added value of including promotion, including the prices, and including both promotion and prices. So as you can see, including promotion adds a lot to this project because this really allows the tool to understand what's going on with and without promotion and what's the impact of promotion. Again, this is a very good use case for machine learning. We have so much data, we have information about promotion shortages and so on. But actually, even on data set where we only have 36 months of demand, no promotion, no shortages, just 36 months of data by month, um, that would be the, the case study I published for this chemical company. Again, you can um, follow the link after when I send you the slide. We had an improvement of 20%. What I'm saying here is even if we have no business driver at all, machine learning can add a lot of value. Now, there is a limit to that. There is a limit to that. It's that machine learning is not a silver bullet. So it's not going to be magical. It's not something you can plug in in any single tool and it's going to work just on its own. That's not how it works. So for machine learning to work, you need to have a very specific skill set. You need to really look at how you feed data into the tool, how you optimize the tool, how you um, clean the data. All these steps are critical. So if you have a project and you just randomly dump a database into a neural network, it's basically not going to work. And if you do that and you just assess, well, machine learning doesn't work for us, it's not the issue of machine learning. It's more an issue that we didn't spend enough time doing data cleaning. We didn't spend enough time discussing how we would feed data to this model. And also, we didn't spend much time discussing um, how can we optimize this model. So that would be basically the three steps that are really um, required to um, optimize such a model and to ensure that such a model would work. This being said, I again have a question for you. Let me should be there. Yes. So my question for you now, it's an open question. I would love to, to hear um, your point of view and to hear your stories. Um, did you try yet to implement some machine learning in your supply chain in your company? Was it a success? Was it a failure? And if you didn't do that, is there some specific reason why you're not doing it? Uh, I'm really curious to, to hear about your stories. Basically, uh, also, I think it's important. This is anonymous, so I will I will not try to find who said what. It's just for the pleasure to to exchange and, and discuss that. And this will also allow um, people to see what, what is going on. Oh, sorry. So it's interesting that I see a lot of yes. A lot of yes, a lot of on ongoing. This is really, really interesting. 
Now, if you want to take some more time to type down your story and your experience with it, it can be a positive experience or a bad experience. Uh, maybe take the time to note it down in the comment section so we have the time to read it uh, even after the keynote. I think that would be very interesting, especially that I'm sure that a lot of you are looking for advice or stories of uh, success stories or failure stories to learn from that and learn from each other. So don't hesitate to take a minute to type your story into the, the comment section so we can all exchange on, on that. Let me move back with this slide. So uh, what I was saying there is if you just have well a black box and you just dump data into it, it's very unlikely it's going to work. And actually, if I would meet personally with another data scientist working on forecasting uh, using machine learning, we, the, the question I would ask wouldn't be, hey, what kind of model are you using? I would more ask question about the data. What kind of data are you using? How did you clean it? And how do you feed it to the model? For me, these questions are much more important than asking, are you using a neural network? Yes, no. That, that wouldn't teach me much, and I wouldn't be able to replicate any of the results. To replicate something or to improve it or to get better ID, my question would all relate to what kind of data are you using and how do you frame it into um, machine learning? Now let's move on. So we discussed the um, advantages of machine learning and why it's so good and it's going to beat statistical tools. But then there is a second part to it. So as I told you, I think that we, if, if you want to aim for demand planning extents, you need two fun. So you need a really good forecast engine that does the baseline for you. So it is kind of bulletproof, bulletproof automated baseline. And the second thing you're going to need is forecast value added. And you need to bring these two together, OK? That's going to basically avoid this sentence saying that 50% of planners couldn't improve forecasting accuracy. But before I explain, re-explain what forecast value added is, I would like, again, to have kind of a feedback from you asking how familiar are you with forecast value added? Maybe you never heard about that, or maybe you're already using it and it's a success so far. OK, so it's still a minority of people using it. So success so far, it's 10%. OK, we have 20% of people who say, well, I'm trying, but not yet there. And then for most of you, you heard about it, but it's not, not using it. It's not using it right now. Very interesting. OK, let me move on with forecast value added. So to explain you very simply what forecast value added is, I'm going to start with a very simple process. So let's just imagine that you have in your supply chain a process that just looks like uh, this one there. So basically, you start with, I'm going to go back to this benchmark later. So you start with a forecasting model. It could be anything. Honestly, it could be you using a moving average in Excel. That that's counts as a forecasting model. And then you have the demand planning teams. They're going to enrich, edit this forecast, the sales team, and the consensus meeting, some sort of SNOP uh, sign off. Now, what we want to do that for every single step in this process, we're going to track the accuracy, the forecast error, and the bias they have. So you know that I'm a big fan of mean absolute error and bias, and you know that you should, in no case, you should use MAPI. So MAPI is the worst KPI. I think this is clear for all of you right now. So you have to stick to MAE and bias. So the point is, for every single step in this process, you're going to track the accuracy, the error achieved by every single step, and the bias. And what we want to do is for each step we're going to compute, do they add value compared to the previous step? So here in my example, we see that the forecasting model is doing just great. So you see that I reduce the error compared to the benchmark. That's just great. Demand planners also reduce the MAE compared to this forecasting model. That is just great. Now, unfortunately, the sales team and the consensus meeting, they don't add much value. So by tracking this month after month, week after week, we're going to know that well, some team really add a lot of value, some people add a lot of value, and some people just don't. So the first question for me would be to compare your current software, your current forecasting model to a benchmark. Um, I know that for years, um, consultant or software vendor, we're advising to compare yourself to a naive forecast. I think this is a bad idea because beating a naive forecast is way too easy. So if you compare yourself to a naive forecast and you say, well, I could beat naive by, I don't know, 5 or 10%, this is so easy to beat naive models that sign that you beat it doesn't say anything about your process, okay? 
So instead of a moving average, um, an A forecast, I would really advise you to use as a benchmark a moving average of six or 12 months, because this is more difficult to beat. So benchmark, you just take the last six months and that's your forecast benchmark. So what's very important is you compare your current process, your current model to this. And I can really tell you that you would be surprised that I think that at least for a quarter of you, if not for half of you, if you don't have a strong model and a strong process, it's likely you don't beat a moving average because you're going to realize that beating a moving average might sound easy, but it's, it's actually quite difficult. So many of you will realize that the process, the current process doesn't beat a moving average. So that's a test I would advise you uh, doing. Now, the next thing that's very interesting here is that when I would discuss with a team of demand planner, I would never ask them to achieve a specific target of accuracy or error. I would ask them to achieve a specific target of added value. Because you know, if you're dealing, if you're leading with a team that is over different type of product, different type of market, different type of channel, it's very likely that just naturally some market, some channel, some product has just easier to forecast than other because demand is much smoother, because it's much more predictable. I don't know, because they don't do any promotion, whatever. So as you have easier product, easier channel, it's very easy for you to achieve excellent accuracy, but it doesn't say anything about your added value. Maybe your colleague who's achieving a very bad accuracy, actually this colleague is adding a lot of value because this colleague can really communicate with the client, get some nice information and so on. So if you are an SNOP leader, a demand player leader and so on, I would really advise you to move from a mindset of accuracy target to move to a mindset of added value target. And that's much more meaningful. Now there's one question remaining here and you're saying, well, okay, Nicola, let's imagine I could do that and I assess that, well, this team has an issue. But the next question would be, how can we help them to improve? How can we help them to reduce politics in this process? These questions, these two questions are very important, but that's not the topic for today. I will most likely deal with two, these two questions in another webinar. In, at the end of the day, if you're really interested to see how to do that, that would be in my book. But for today, I just wanted to introduce you to both why machine learning is so good and how can you use forecast value added together with it. And if you merge forecast value added and machine learning together, it's very likely you're going to achieve what I call demand planning excellence. So that's it for me. I did that in nearly 40 minutes. And now I'm going to take a look at the comment section and answer your question. So if you have any kind of question, you can directly type this in the comment section and I'm going to take a look uh, right now. Um, and I had a question at the start of the webinar. Let me go back to it from Enrique. Let me answer the question from Enrique. So Enrique was asking, well, if you track forecast value added, um, what's the kind of benchmark you see there in terms of improvement? Um, so first, um, I think that as a baseline, as a benchmark, you shouldn't use naive because naive is too easy to beat. So again, I would use moving average six months or 12 months. That would be my first step. I think that a good forecasting model, you should be able to beat this. It depends a bit from supply chain to supply chain and how much info you have, but you should be able to beat this to reduce forecasting error by 10 to 30%. If you don't reduce the forecast error of moving average by more than 5%, it's very likely something is wrong or you might change the model or you should just think again on how you're cleaning data. Okay, so 5% for me, it's kind of um, a tough call. And if your forecast engine does not reduce uh, error by more than by, by just 5%, it means something is likely very wrong and you would just be better just using this moving average. Um, now, in terms of the team, I think it's very likely that if you have a very good forecast engine, the team can still reduce the error by up to 10% because they will always have access to information and insights that the tool is not aware of. For example, they might just be able to call your client to get an ID directly from your client on how the situation is going, how much stocks they have and so on. So just by doing that, they might get some information that the tool is not aware of that would allow them to basically um, improve the quality of the forecast. Let me go back to the comment section to see if there is another question. So here also a question from uh, Jorge, Jorge uh, Vargas. He's asking if there is any specific machine learning software that I have seen in action uh, and I would recommend. So 
For me, all the good machine learning models I've seen were all based in Python and were all using open libraries. Um, but disclaimer, I haven't seen every single machine learning solution in the world. Of course, my own knowledge and experience is limited, but in my own experience with the people I'm talking to and so on, every single uh, success story is based on using open model using Python. Again, this is just based on my experience and the people who are talking to me. Uh, I'm sure you might find some other people using something else. But as a start, I would definitely go for this open source model using Python because that's basically uh, what everyone is using right now. Let me take a look at other um, question. Yes, so Jorge Puentes is asking, can you explain me the difference between the two column on this forecast value and its slides? Yes, sure. So on the left side, you have MAE, which stands for mean absolute error. That's the right way to compute the, the forecasting error. And on the right way, on the right column, you have bias which is basically saying if you are over forecasting or under forecasting demand. And what we want, and that's something that I really take the time to explain um, in my latest book, we want to be good in both of these KPIs. So you want to be as, you want the mean absolute error to be as low as possible. And at the same time, you want bias to be as close as possible to zero. And if you want to, to do a, a forecast that's gonna result in good decision, you want this forecast to be low in both, okay? So if you would get a forecast that is has an ME that's really low, but a bias that's either extremely high or extremely low, this will result in very bad decision and poor trust within the supply chain. So you really need to tackle both. So I've unfortunately seen a lot of supply chain with very low maturity level that either only track bias or only track MAE, or they are tracking MAPI. So that's really things that you want to avoid. The best practice is really to track ME and bias. Now, this being said, I also answered the other question I received from someone else, unknown user. So hello, unknown user. Um, this person is asking, can we measure forecastability using COV? Um, COV stands for coefficient of variation. I strongly advise against using COV. COV is not the worst thing you can do, but for me, this is really a bad practice because COV relates to variation compared to average demand, so it's something you should not take a look at and you should not use COV at all. Um, I, I did multiple webinars where I discussed that and I, I published a few articles on that, so if you want more detail, you can find that online, but I'm advising against uh, COV. Um, let me check other question. Let me just check this quickly. Yes, let me answer two questions. So first question from F Filippo Belloni. Thank you for your question. Um, so forecast value added, it's a great tool because it's easy to explain, easy to, um, easy to show to the rest of the organization, easy to understand. And I find simplicity is great. So that's that's really great. Now, forecast value added in terms of data management is quite difficult. To do this, it really requires you to save a forecast version for every single team and to do this kind of dashboard for every single month, for every single lag. So you need to track this at M plus one, M plus two, M plus three, and you need to do this every month. So maybe as a one-off exercise, you can do that in Excel once, but I really wouldn't advise you to do this in Excel on your own, because that's gonna be a nightmare for you of manual work. So forecast value added is very easy to understand, but it's not easy to implement from scratch. Either I would, instead, I would advise you to basically use a special software to do that, and a lot of software do it. Um, I think three months ago, I did a webinar just on forecast value added. I had uh, two other people uh, coming to the webinar to present how they use forecast value added for their own um, supply chain and companies and, and what were their own path with it and their own uh, learning journey. And we had um, uh, Stefan from Stu Science, a company I co-funded, who basically gave a demo on how to use forecast value added on Stu Science. Now, this being said, you have a lot of tools that allow you to track forecast value added. My advice is I would never, never invest in a forecasting software if it doesn't do good forecast value added dashboard. So if you're thinking about implementing a new software right now, the first condition I would say is I want to see your forecast value added dashboard. And if it doesn't look, 
easy and simple to you, I would simply say, well, we're going to look for another software. Forecast value added in terms of process is tremendously important. So if this doesn't work in your software, I would simply change. Now, last question from uh, Mohamed Boulam. What about intermittent um, demands? And I receive a lot of questions every every month, every week from people asking questions about intermittent um, demand. It's it's a change. Intermittent demand is 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 changing. So you you never find a tool that can do intermittent demand forecasting um, really well simply because it's so difficult. No, still machine learning is extremely likely to beat. Um, specific statistical uh, models such as Coston and the like. I'm not a big fan of Coston, and actually, um, I think five years or four years ago, I wrote an article explaining how Coston works online, and I think I received no one million view on this article. And this article is simply saying, well, Coston is not a good idea, don't do it. But people seem to really love the article because I really explained the math, and I show you how you can do it in Python yourself. But Coston overall it is not a good idea, and it's unlikely you're going to get any good result using Coston. I would still stick to machine learning. Now, Mohamed is also asking, well, if I have intermittent demand, what kind of KPI should I use? I would always stick to these two, ME and BIAS, but you need to look at these two combined, not just one. You really need to look at the two combined together. And as long as you stick to ME and BIAS together, you're going to be fine. Um, OK, that was the last question for Today, I think it's time. It was really a pleasure to have you uh, all together on this webinar. Thank you so much for the interaction. Thank you for your question. Thank you for answering WooClamp. That was a pleasure. Um, if I can have one feedback from you, don't hesitate to send me an email um, proposing ideas for future webinar, future article and content. I would love to hear basically what's a challenge for you today so I can make more content. So let me wish you a great day if you are somewhere in Latin America or the US, a great evening if you are in Europe, and a great night if you are in Asia. And see you later on LinkedIn. Ciao, everyone.